Stephanie Seeger and Oh, I think that there were some beeps on there. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. This is Stephanie Seeger, and I am the uh, um, manager for Equal Therapies. And I wanted to do a webinar tonight based off of essential oils and pet care. So some of the going to essential oils as well as safety and some um, kind of guidelines, not really regulations because they're not really that strict, but just kind of some word of word of advice and also word of caution. So um, a little bit of background about me is that I am a licensed veterinary technician in the state of Virginia and I've been licensed for maybe about three years going on four years and then I've been in the veterinary field for about seven years. So um, I've gathered a good amount of experience as well as have been working with some holistic doctors as well as some other nurses and some other people that have been using essential oils as well as um, integrative therapy and a more holistic mind frame for quite some time. And so I've gathered some experiences and by no means am I like the only resource that, um, that you guys should be using. So I also encourage you to do your own research as well. Um, some of the things that I do, uh, I actually go like with Eagle Therapies, I can go to different people's houses because I like doing house calls. And um, and what I will do is that um, just I ask for compensation and gas, uh, gas money as well as um, I, I always do everything sliding scale. So then that way I can get go into the environment and kind of see how the pet reacts to a certain situation. So most of the time I get um, I get house calls uh, or a combination of uh, different things thereof, like peeing outside the litter box, things like that. And I always know when to or, or when is um, to get people into their better um, to get their to get the owners into take their pets to the veterinarian. So then that way we can kind of work in combination. I also do official write-ups and documentation. So then that way we're on the same page. And then once the animal doctor also uh, the essential oils that I have recommended, then we can kind of stay on board and do things like that. So if you guys are interested, then feel free to, um, to message me after. So as we kind of go into the webinar tonight, what are essential oils? So um, some of the bullet, per, uh, bullet point things that, um, that essential oil are, uh, they're natural aromatic compounds that are found in, uh, in plants and they are 50 to 75 times more potent than dried or powdered herbs. They are the uh, byproduct of being distilled for a good number of time and each depends on the different type of plant. But, um, but most of the time, the dark, the leaves or the stems, sometimes the roots. So um, either that or sometimes the, the fruit itself, um, as in some of the citrus oils. So um, I'm just going to go over they kind of because the the reason why they are therapeutic in quality is because of the fact that they uh, have the um, chemical constituents in them. So the chemical constituents, they are in a homeostasis, so they balance everything out. So, um, like, for example, the, the biggest example that, that I can give is for winter, for example, uh, Native Americans used to boil willow bark. And so when they would boil willow bark, then they would chew on it for pain relief. And the reason why is because the, um, the biggest chem or the most leaving quality of the willow bark is going to be the salicylic acid or um, that type of compound. So what pharmaceutical companies have done is that they've recognized that specific chemical constituent and they have extracted it from the natural source, which is that homeostasis or that balance that we're talking about to over time is, uh, is if taken out of context, then it, then it can lead to different side effects. So um, say, for example, if we still stick to the aspirin, uh, the aspirin type of metaphor, then it could lead to like a gastrointestinal bleeding or blood thing thinning. Um, and yeah, but uh, essential oils themselves are whole from the plant. The, it's the plant's natural immune system. It how it, it's how it protects itself from other things in nature. Um, they are um, on the plant, the, uh, like the the leaves or. The 
problems and uh, it's how it repels certain bugs or pests so then that way um, it attracts certain things and so they have an antimicrobial type of quality to them or a vast number of them do and so that's the reason why we like to utilize in treatment protocols but just kind of in association with complementing different uh, modalities of healing, uh, such as if you were to go to a doctor and say, for example, your dog has an upset stomach because it's on a heavy course of antibiotics, then you can probably give some peppermint so, to help ease its digestion. So then that way it makes uh, a little bit more comfortable. So that's kind of what my goal is. And the major thing that I want to get across tonight is that um, I do want you guys to do your own research in terms of you being your own pet's advocate. So I don't want people to walk away from this webinar thinking that they can apply any essential oil that they want to or any combination of essential oils and think that it's going to be safe. I do want people to kind of explore what the most common essential oils are or talk to people that are in the veterinary field or that are more experienced with essential oils themselves because um, there has been a lot of misuse and a lot of mispractice that I would like to address. And one of the main reasons why I wanted to start a webinar series is because of that fact of misinterpretation or miscommunication. So hopefully this will help provide some clarity. So then that way people can feel more confident in being able to give their um, to give their pets some sort of essential oil to help is some sort of either pain relief or um, or if they have like. Uh, what do you call it? If they want to support their digest risks, then definitely in combination with some of the things that a veterinarian would recommend um, can go very well together and very good hand in hand. Um, one of the other reasons why I am very cautious in doing, uh, in teaching full scale is because if you do look back in history, maybe about like as recent as 10 years ago, and, um, and a lot of people have been, uh, have had reported that when they use essential oils on their pets, because I'm going to go and, and this kind of eases into the next section that I'm going to cover, which is safety. And so the, the next section that I sometimes am hesitant in bringing up, but I always do bring it up just because I get concerned for the pet's well-being. is um, the fact that using essential oils and applying them on their animals, and there have been documented deaths. So um, I'm not base, um, just because we do live in a society where there is an abundance of information. So no matter where you look, you can find some evidence to support different things, and then you can also find some evidence to disprove certain things. So how do we know which credible resources are the ones that we should listen to, um, et cetera, et cetera? I will say, though, that the reported and documented deaths that have happened before, and the reason why a lot of veterinarians as well as medical professionals are kind of against using essential oils on pets is because there has not been that great a study on the quality of the essential oil. The quality of the essential oil is going to matter the most because the purity is what, um, is what matters. So I'll kind of dive into that. And then I'll just kind of keep a track on time here. And then um, because I know that this is a pretty big topic, what I intend to do with these webinar series is I intend to have this be the basics. So then that way I don't have to keep repeating this over and over again. And, um, and then that way each additional webinar as of that, I'll, I'll still have like the little, um, like the little disclaimers and I'll still say, oh, just be careful and all this stuff, but I won't go as in depth as I will this time. So then that way, the additional webinars, I can go over in 30 minute segments, like specific things that I can cover. So, connection. Oh no, it's saying that network connecting is difficult. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's, it, it's uh, you guys can still see me okay. 
but um but yeah feel free to either email me or text so there are four different grades of essential oils the first grade is going to be the synthetic grade this is going to be the most commonly found essential oils uh, just because they are still kind of on the back burner we've done um, it, like a lot of multi-level marketing companies have done a lot of the forefront in making sure that people get educated on essential oils so now a wide variety of people um, and a wide variety of the population do know about them so that is a positive of um, things. Unfortunately, misuse has also <laughs> has also gone up in number as well. So um, a misuse or misinformation. I, I let me correct myself. But it's it's also just because we're still learning and the essential oils themselves, the the therapeutic quality as well as the education has been a. Um, a more newer forefront, so to speak. I mean, I don't want to say anything that misleads anybody, but um, but yeah, there there has been uh, on the quality of the essential oils themselves. Now that we have a little bit more regulation, um, it's a little bit better. But um, but yeah, so with the synthetic grade, that's going to be a chemically synthesized version of what is found in nature. These are replicated when a person finds out that lavender is really good for, um, for say, sleep problems, then they will go ahead and, um, and they will go to the store, buy a $2 bottle of lavender, and then when they get home, they want to vomit because the lavender that they purchased is not the greatest and it just kind of smells like lavender scented poo. So it's, um, <laughs> it's a... Uh, there, there is little to no therapeutic quality in the lavender that you find, like say in a, a Glade plug-in or, um, or, or some of the other types of chemical things that you find. So a lot of the time when you, I'm a big label reader just because I have a lot of allergies. But, um, but whenever you look on the side of some sort of greener or uh, sometimes even on our food, you'll notice that there is a thing that says natural flavoring or um, essential oils and they don't actually dictate or pick which one it is. So that's usually an indicator that they are adding some sort of, uh, some sort of chemically synthesized essential oil. So. Yeah, that's it's kind of hard to, to regulate or or to kind of understand from there. The step up from that is going to be the food grade. So these are the ones that um, the FDA has labeled as uh, generally regarded as safe for consumption. So the, those are the grass standards, by the way. And the essential, sometimes these are a little bit more regulated and um, sometimes you do get into companies that are able to um, do a little bit more better marketing or they, um, they actually put like the correct things on the label. But I would encourage you to do research on the company company itself uh, if you are interested in doing some other essential oils just because you never really want to use essential oils internally and I'll go over the different applications of how to use them but you never really want to use it unless you really kind of know what you're doing so um, I'm not really an advocate for one that says oh you should drink this amount like uh, go ahead and put these in a capsule and blah 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 just because somebody on the internet told you to just kind of keep doing your research and kind of keep going from there because a lot of the time it is trial and error. But um, with the food grade, it's a little bit better quality because sometimes these can come from the plants themselves. However, like say for example, if a company does buy like 100 pounds of lavender and then they put them in a distill, uh, a, a, a still because that's how you get essential oils is you distill them so um, with a, a bulk majority of them they are steam distilled but for some of them they are actually cold press so with this uh, with the lab you go ahead and steam distill that some companies will actually add a chemical filler to it and so when somebody applies the essential oil then they are unsure like there raises the question on what are they actually allergic to to the essential allergic to the chemical filler so that is a is a big thing in and of itself so <clears throat> uh, 
Then as we move up from the food grade, then we go into the therapeutic grade. So the therapeutic grade is going to be a little bit more controlled and regulated. So um, these can come from like the different mom and pop places because I do actually get some essential oils from people that make their own essential oils. So I, I still do it like for people that can um, that can raise the plants in their own I raise with love and care, which is a thing. Then um, then sometimes they can go ahead and distill their own essential oils. But I mean, it does take a lot of bulk oil in order to do that. But I mean, um, it, that still can be a good high quality essential oil. But still, there's um, like you have to be careful about how you procure the um, the the plant material. It's harvesting is a big component of it. So um, there are some companies do in order to. One of the dangerous things that we approach into is that for a company that does not really regulate things as much, or they just set up a middleman contract and they get essential oils from uh, from like a, a a person. Like you have to go through a person in order to get to the farms. Then that is another thing in and of itself because sometimes improper handling techniques. Like say for example that somebody goes ahead and they. Um, just a whole bunch of lavender in the field and then they accidentally have some ragweed in there too. So if the essential oil is going to be 50 to 70 times more potent than dried or powdered herbs, then we ask the question, what is that going to do to the weed? So if somebody has a concentrated version of a weed that they are allergic to and they place that on their skin or their pet skin, then that raises the question of are they allergic to the essential oil itself or are they allergic to the um, to what has been added without even recognizing or knowing what it is. So there are all of these different questions that uh, that we kind of come across. So just to kind of get it out there and clear in the open, I do uh, uh, I do teach classes for both both for doTERRA as well as Young Living. Um, some of the classes that I teach up in New York, young, New York is very Young Living heavily popular. So main, but there are some brands that are out there that um, that do a lot more care in their research of how they procure their plants. So um, so especially I know that. For me personally, I have a membership with doTERRA, so uh, I do know that they take the care in being able to set up those partnerships with different places, and they make sure that they um, that they grow them in the best places that um, that have the therapeutic qualities that we are looking for. Because where a plant is grown, it has different qualities to it. And um, because it depends on the amount of sunlight that it gets, the amount of humidity, the nutrients in the soil, all of these different things play a factor in how healthy that plant actually is. So um, I do know that there are some companies out there, and once again, do your research, but there are some companies out there that I would recommend over others. So yeah, there you go. So that is um, kind of covering some of the different bases, but once again, I will say this, that you are your pet's advocate. So before we kind of dive into the ways on how to apply them, please take note of your pet's reaction after you apply the oils. So I'll go into this a little bit more in just a moment, but I wanted to put that out there as well. So if you do notice that your pet is still like there, there are some lines that sometimes you have to, that you have to kind of get a little bit more wavy, or sometimes it's a little bit unclear of when you should take them to the vet or not, especially when we start going into end of life care. But, um, but there are things that we need to be cautious about. So if a pet is, for example, if you put some sort of essential oil on their feet and then they get reactive and then they start doing this with their feet because it's a little bit too hot because you forgot to dilute it, then just kind of pay attention after you go ahead and, and apply some of the things like that. So, yeah. <clears throat> so the three ways on how to apply essential oils are going to be aromatic, uh, aromatic, topically, and internally. So I will not go over how to do it internally just because I get kind of, that, that can be very case by case specific. So I will mostly be covering the aromatic as well as topical application today. So um, for aromatic, the most, uh, one of the, one of the more common ways of how to get aromatic topic, uh, aromatic 
application huh, <laughs> is, um, is going to be with a diffuser. So what type of diffusers that people are going to be looking for are going to be the atomizer type of diffusers. So I know that in the past heat diffusers, but what heat does is that heat will actually break apart some of the, um, the therapeutic qualities or the chemical constituents of the essential oils. So you do want to watch out for that. It's not saying that if you diffuse it, that it's going to, um, that it's going to completely negate the healthy factors of it. I mean, it's, it's still going to work. Work. I mean, it's you're diffusing it, but it's it's not the best way for it to be diffused. So the nebulizer type of um, uh, of diffusers that are out there, which are the most common ones right now, they they can range anywhere from like um, I've seen them somewhere dollars to um, sometimes upwards to like a hundred, hundred and fifty, sometimes two hundred dollars. So it kind of depends on how you want the the oil to be spread and for how long, et cetera, et cetera. But um, but aromatic is actually the most common way of which I recommend and use the essential oils in pets. So <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons why essential oils are very potent and very effective when used aromatically is because when you smell an essential oil, then it gets into your room and the rest is connected to the amygdala, which is the brain uh, that is responsible for emotions, as well as the blood pressure, the heart rate, and all these other different things. And, and it's like the system, so yeah, because it's connected to the limbic system, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I can get more technical, but I'm trying to condense it. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, another benefit to, uh, to diffusing the essential oils is going to be the fact that um, <clears throat> everybody in the fit or everybody that comes into the room is going to benefit. So um, there are going to be some differences. So obviously, if we're talking about indoor animals, like say dogs or cats or guinea pigs or exotic animals and things like that, because I have used um, essential oils in exotics and like uh, um, like birds and reptiles, things like that. So yeah, the experience is limited. However, I do know that it works. <laughs> be one of the ones that I, that I most um, really careful just because sometimes uh, some of them can be sensitive to it. So as long as you give them an out, like don't put the diffuser right next to their workage. <laughs> like especially if it's like the first time that you're doing it. But, um, but you do kind of, than ours here than what ours would so they tend like what we would normally use for cats for example I would probably only use and um, but in a in a diffuser like you would it, you'd probably use like four to five depending on how big the room is but it also depends on the strength that's emanating from the diffuser as well as how long you leave them in the room, et cetera, et cetera, because there are some treatment protocols that you could do and all this other stuff, and it can get complicated. Um, for dogs, you can pretty much treat them like people because they're pretty hardy and pretty resistant. Their, their system, in my experience at least, in the their system is pretty much just like – they love essential oil. I have videos of going over to some client and uh, the essential oil books are rolling all get all entity. So I'm not sure if disguised the smell of duck and a lot of dogs type of th I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just here and here to relay the information. So um, yeah, another benefit to um, to diffusing some of the oil helps purify. So I know that this is esoteric, but sometimes what ends up ha happening is, is that when you, um, 
when you diffuse them in like an atomizer diffuser, it, what it does is that it gently vibrates it and then pushes the aromatic compounds into the air. And what ends up happening is, is uh, especially for the citrus oils and um, some of the other oils, what they do is that they bind to some of the, um, to some of like the more toxic things and they kind of neutralize them out. So um, yeah, there's, there's a very, good research that their purification is one of the reasons I like to do it. People, if they had like a really rough day or say, for example, that they have a big fight with somebody, then you know how sometimes like you go into a room and you get that, oh, type of feeling. Um, our pets are very sensitive to that and that esoteric thing but very sensitive to one of the times after like people have a big fight and it's kind of lingering in the air um, or to kind of clear the air is just to throw on an oil and go ahead and change the energy of the room and it's as simple as that so simple aromatherapy there you go um, use for aromatic is going to be uh, supporting the rest because obviously it's going to affect your respiratory you're breathing it in that's what we use to breathe so <laughs> so so yeah that that's kind of um some of the minty type of family type things um will be able to help support that really like the eucalyptus and things like that so um so yeah that's aromatic use uh, as we get into topical use um this will kind of depend on species let me see how i'm doing on time all right, so we're at the 30 minute mark. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me kind of break this down. I'll start with dogs, not saying that other animals are greatest, but uh, are, are not as great. But I mean, I'll just kind of start with dogs just because they're the most common ones that I see. So um, with canines, treat them the same as cats and Cats also are kind of in the, you want to treat them like an infant. So I would say maybe about zero to 10 pounds. You want to heavily dilute uh, with some sort of carrier oil, like coconut oil or olive oil, neem oil, um, apricot oil, avocado oil. So all of these different types of oils, it um, helps it. It does not bring down the strength. This is where some of the mis or some of the misinfo because some people have strength go down. In actuality, what it does is that it helps distribute the essential oil so then that way it's not at a focal point because most of the reason why we have a reaction to an essential oil is focalized location. So it's kind of like taking a laser pointer and pointing it at somebody's hand for quite some time. So some people can especially over time, but it's because it's that focalized type of reaction. So with an, um, with a carrier oil, what that does is that spreads out the, um, the surface area. So then that way it also increases the amount that, um, that it will be able to hold over time. So, um, cause essential oils are very volatile. So they evaporate quickly in air. So when you apply it on a carrier oil, um, sometimes you can notice the smell like really impactful at that moment when you when you try it on or when you put it on, but then it just kind of evaporates or disapparates from there. And so with the carrier oil does is that it kind of helps curb that a little bit so then instead of like a wham type of um, type of reaction, you'll actually get a steady but incline with the, uh, uh, and, and sometimes the application or the duration or of the therapeutic quality can vary in essential oil anywhere between um, 30 minutes, up to four hours. So uh, one of the reasons why I like essential oils is because they are all natural. And especially if you use them aromatically or topically, our body detoxes from them very well. So um, reapplication is often more necessary just do it all at once it's actually better to do like a drop here and then wait a couple hours drop here or wait an hour or two then drop here so um for some of the more aggressive techniques then we'll kind of talk about that in a bit but yeah so um as well as dogs zero to ten pounds treat like an infant so i would probably say a generous amount of carrier oil and um like maybe 
a teaspoon, teaspoon or tablespoon, essential oil it is, um, the more caustic ones than um, like especially cinnamon or peppermint, um, eucalyptus. This thing. Well, eucalyptus is kind of more on the milder side, but cassia is another good one uh, to kind of go on the caution side of heavily diluting. So like a tablespoon and like a, um, a few drops of the uh, of any type of like the more caustic essential oils. Oregano. Oregano is also a really good one to dilute. Otherwise, you will get tears. So um, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so the probably about 10 to I want to say like maybe 25, 30 pounds, I would probably treat like a kid. So um, like, or maybe a little bit older. So if, if they do it, then I will go ahead and still dilute it a little bit. Um, if, uh, if they don't have a reaction, then I tend to apply like peppermint and, um, and some other things need. But once again, this, this, the, the precaution that I threw in earlier, I will throw in again, watch your pet's reaction. So the first one, I always kind of, like the first application, I always kind of recommend putting on a carrier oil and then going ahead and um, and going from there and seeing how they respond to it. So, um, so yeah. And then uh, for dogs that are above 40 pounds, I don't even worry about them. And I just kind of put on oils as necessary. So... Yeah, that, that's just kind of the general rule of thumb. In my experience of what I have seen has has been a good, healthy, functioning type of thing. So each pet has their own tolerance level of what they say, owie, that hurts, That's I'm too sensitive for that. Because I have seen chihuahuas take essential oils neat. And that was, that was like, whoa, okay, all right. So the situation called for that and it definitely worked. And then I have some Great Danes that I have applied essential oils to. And then they, says they are just like, ah, I, I feel uncomfortable. And then I add a carrier oil and then they stop whining. So it, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's um, a case basis, but that is going to be the, um, the most widely accepted of, uh, of like a dilution scale that I can give you guys. So where to apply it. This kind of gets tricky too, because it kind of depends on the classification. So some of the more milder ones, then I, I will apply, uh, cats have like this anatomy structure. So right in, like right behind the eyes, like you'll notice like a little bald spot right here. And then there's their ear. Like, so you'll notice that there's a bald spot in between. That's called the preauricular fossa. So um, what I like to do is I like to take the essential oil bottle and I invert it a couple of times. And then that way I have like a little bit of residue on my finger and then I apply it gently to that preauricular fossa. And um, that's where the hair is gonna be the thinnest on cats. So um, the, if it's going to be a milder type and say for example that they are more prone to anxious behavior or they are more prone to, um, to stress, then I would recommend some calming essential oils to kind of help there because that is close to this because this is what we're trying to affect, the respiratory system. So if you've got a very scared or fractious cat, um, I have seen, like, it, it's sometimes hit or miss because I have used essential oil. Like, I'm known as the oil lady at work. So <laughs> for a fractious cat or a fractious dog, I will actually apply the essential oils to me first. And then if the owner is willing to try the essential oils, then then on to the pet. But for the most part, since I apply them like right before I go into the room, sometimes we do notice a visible difference in their behavior as soon as I enter the room because I have the essential oils on me and I act as a diffuser. So um, that's another way. is that person going to be more sensitive or is that person like, is the dog going to be more sensitive? So it kind of depends. And there are some emergency oils that I will pull out. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so uh, you can do that. I know that sometimes with dogs, they have the, the ear flaps. So for the floppy ear dogs, a lot of the time, if you lift up the ear, this is going to be for the more calmer oils. So no peppermint and <laughs> like um, no peppermint, no 
meant to the ear. But um, but what I do is that um, like say for example that the um, that the ear is kind of like a little bit gross, then I will invert the oil on my um, on my fingers again, and then I will go ahead and apply a drop or two on the in on like the um, the floppy part, like the the place where there's not a lot of not a lot of fur, and then um, and then yeah, another good spot or location to put on pets like dogs and cats is going to be in so even though that I'm doing like some sort of type of live long and prosper, like you can um, you can go ahead and, and apply a drop or two in between their paw pads. Most of the time, I actually don't dilute it because um, the only time when I do dilute it is going to be with like the cats or the ones that are under 10 pounds. But most of the time, I just go ahead and apply it neat because half the time the dog's going to lick it off anyway. And um, the one the the essential oils that I use are pure enough to where won't do anything for their um, for their internal organ function. I haven't seen it, but um, but yeah the. The only one that I will say cats is melaleuca or tea tree oil. So I heavily caution against that. And I'm not saying don't use it. And I'm also like, do your own research. But for me and my experience, please don't. Um, just because uh, I know that Dr. Roberts of, at work has actually seen um, kittens that have passed away. That uh, just because a person saw that they had runny eyes and so they applied tea tree oil directly to the tear ducts and within maybe about an, uh, actually I, I forgot the mortality rate of it, but yeah, they, they did not make it. So um, just kind of use caution. <laughs> and uh, and even though that the that some of the oils out there do are pure still that doesn't make up for the fact that um, that melaleuca or tea tree oil does have uh, terpenes in it and the terpenes are toxic to cats so especially with acetaminophen toxicity toxicity um, acetaminophen is our over-the-counter pain medication and we have seen some pets get into that just because hey I want to chew on something especially kittens because they're very curious and they're trying to explore their world so unfortunately they get a hold of the wrong thing and that's about all you can do so um, but yeah sorry to get a little bit depressed right there use melaleuca in cats or I would strain away from it and it's okay if you have applied it by accident or if you've diffused it in the air once again that's why I say if you have the diffuser set up somewhere and you give the cat the ability to walk away that's where it's a little bit more effective and once again um, the research the research into essential oils and animals has not been as heavily dedicated as in human research. So we're still experimenting and a lot of this is trial and error. So um, so a lot of these recommendation, recommendations I have seen out of my own experience with using essential oils in combinations clients and the factors in association with it. I don't claim to know everything, but I have worked with um, veterinarians that have used the um, oils in pets. And I do know that there is a manual for essential oils. Uh, I currently have the book in my car, which is not very helpful to you guys on this webinar right now, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I can definitely have the link up and I have looked into like a course or two of hers. And um, she is a, a, a regular DVM. Uh, well, she is a holistic DVM and she does uh, like research into the field of, uh, of application on essential oils and pets. So, um, but yeah, so we covered paw pads, the thin spot on ears, and then we've also got the little space for cats. Um, sometimes if some animals, like it depends because a lot of the time pets are too fluffy for us to act actually onto them topically. But if you've got a thin type of coat of an animal, then it gets a little bit easier. So, um, yeah, because I mean, you can, I have done is that if I know that the oil is not going to get to the under part of their coat, then, um, then like say for example, that they are prone to uh, moments of high intensity stress. So um, so if I know that they have like a furry coat right here, then I will actually just tell the owner just to go ahead and apply a couple of drops without diluting it because it's not getting down to the actual skin. 
and the skin is what we want to get down to because that's where the capillaries are. So then that way the essential oils can get into the bloodstream and systemically affect the animal on a, on a therapeutic quality. So yeah, an example that have applied it, to, or if we have applied it to an animal that um, that is prone to those moments of high stress, then uh, then yeah, right on the chest works just because then they're smelling it and the smell rises. So, um, but also if you have a really skittish, that's why these are kind of guidelines and kind of you can twerk them and manipulate them and kind of all this other stuff. So um, another good source that I have actually found is the dog oiler. So the dog oiler is on Facebook as well as the dog um, I'm not sure if the is in the prefix or not, but, uh, but yeah, I have gotten some good information from her and I have talked with her um, a little bit. I mean, it was between stuff, but yeah, it, she's a very nice person. She's awesome. And she has um, some really cool like little PDFs and everything. So you can also Check out that research. Um, let's see. When going into, I'll try and uh, cover some other things. Horses. Uh, when going into horses, you you can. I actually like to apply it like right on their neck. So um, like, actually for me, right where I like draw the blood, <laughs> I sometimes just apply it onto the jugular. But um, but really no, like I always let horses kind of self-treat themselves. So um, what I end up doing with horses, because they are very smart, is I open up the bottles and then I let them smell it themselves. Because it was actually really funny because one time I had the protective blend and then I also had the digestive blend with me. And uh, and, and so I just kind of opened, um, and then I just went ahead and I applied it. As I was applying it, two horses walked up to me. And so then after that had happened, happened the the owner was actually standing right there at the stables and after i had put one on one wrist and the other on the other wrist and since the horses were right there curious as to what i was doing i walked over to them and then i went to reach for one um and then one of them was actually started like they both started sniffing my hands exactly where the essential oils were and it was funny because i didn't find out later from the owner that gravitated, like one gravitated to one and then the other gravitated to the other. She was also familiar with essential oils too. The thing was, was that the one that gravitated towards the digestive blend was actually prone to colic as well as, um, as well as like some gastro type of load. So that one they had to deworm more often. So it made sense that that one was attracted to the digestive blend because that had fennel and ginger and all these other good essential oils in it too. And then the one that was um, more for the, more for the active blend, that one was the one that tends to get like the runny noses and the um, like had the, <laughs> it was, it was just kind of funny because I didn't even find this out until afterwards, but horses are very smart and I usually don't apply. I know it sounds silly, but without their permission. So <laughs> A lot of times um, horses, as well as a lot of different animals, will get very curious as to what you're doing. So they will come towards you. And with horses, I just kind of offer the different oils. And so sometimes they smell it and they walk away. But if they are, then yeah, then they do that too. I have actually heard through the grapevine. So this was through... I, I don't know of the of the verification of it, but I, I do know that in showing some horses, some people have actually put lavender onto their horses to get them to calm down, or to get them to pay more attention, or to um, or, or to focus a little bit more. Which that is, those are really great applications for them. But what I have heard through the grapevine is that um, some shows are actually starting to test for some of the um, the, the chemical blood. So. Just kind of be aware of that before you start applying, like, oh, I know that my horse gets a little bit panicky because a leaf flew across the, the stadium. But I mean, <laughs> um, so sometimes some people want to kind of drug their horses with essential oils and just slather them all in it. But um, but from what I have heard through the great bows, we'll actually test for that. So just kind of be careful, just word of advice. Um, Another good place, I know that sometimes, um, like a lot of horses tend to have 
feet problems. So a lot of the time, what I will actually recommend, if it's not aromatic, because a lot of the time it's behavioral, why we're starting to integrate um, emotional aromatherapy into horses. But um, but for more of like the medical type of things, like if you want to support what your farrier or what your veterinarian is recommending, then um, then the hoof itself, like you can apply the coronet band. So um, that's a good way to, to apply it in horses. Um, when going to some of the other fluffy things that uh, that we tend to to shear once a year, or twice a year, depending on like how fluffy they get, then um, then obviously you're not going to get through that huge, massive amount of fur. That's our, uh, I I apologize, the fiber that is on them. So um, so that huge, massive amount of fiber. If you put a couple of drops of essential oil, maybe it might see the skin. <laughs> so, um, so what I would do at that point is to go ahead and apply some on my hand and um, th their hair is thinnest in their armpits. So if you apply it to their armpits and sometimes if it's a calmer one, if your sheep or allows it, because most of the time, the um, they are they they tend to be very skittish herd animals, so they will be around you for a certain period of time, but most of the time they won't let you touch them unless they're unless like you're feeding them or something. But um, but yeah, if they allow you to, then you can apply it to their face, like not near their eyes, but just kind of on their like little muzzle. So if they are like a little bit stressed out or anxious, but. The unfortunate thing is that most of the time with livestock, you can't really get that close to them. So, <laughs> but um, but just in case, in, in case you can, like if you're the the farm uh, owner or if you're for them, then that can be an option for you. So um, so yeah, uh, some of the reasons why we might want to apply essential oils um, topically for dogs, cats, or horses is to kind of look at the calming and relaxation benefits to them. So um, looking on time, time check. Oh. But um, but yeah, it's gonna be like for a lot of the, a lot of the time they are little stress balls. And that's the major reason why I get called in is because they are such stress balls that people kind of don't know what to do with them. So, um, so a lot of the time people will integrate it with, I do know um, a few good people that do equine massage. And I do know a couple people that do um, canine massage as well, especially in rehabilitation. So um, it's perfect in that type of sense because it will help relax the muscles as well as sometimes the owner that's giving it as well as um, the pet itself will become a lot more relaxed. So um, the basis of healing in and of itself, because of stress, um, then you're constantly going to be in this adrenaline giving and receiving cycle. So I'm with our bodies constantly in the stress state, we tend to hold these, um, these emotional type of um, type of energies, and we hold them in certain parts of the body. So like, for people, this is more prominent, where if they are stressed, then they will hold it in their shoulders, or they will hold it in their back. And this is why stretching and moving and everything like that is going to be a perfect offset to it. Um, for pets, they hold it a lot in their legs. So you'll notice like a lot of the smaller breeds, they'll just kind of be sitting there and they'll just, uh, 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 so they'll just start shaking. Um, either that or they'll, like that's where they, they, as um, as just kind of along the back. So um, in combination, applying the essential oils to your hands and kind of giving them a nice massage will help ease some of the stress and tension. And, um, and then over time, it can help alleviate some of that stuff. So um, yeah, and uh, it sometimes can provide immediate comfort. Um, some the, the emergency oil that I was talking um, I you know, as well as lavender lavendin and the calming blend as well as the grounding blend so that in combination I have like this pre type of most and that's whenever I go into the room with a fractious animal it's a pretty pungent smell well, I wouldn't say pungent 
And I actually like it, but I have had some coworkers kind of turn their nose at it and be like, oh, Stephanie's at it again. So <laughs> it, it, it's a thing, but, um, but yeah, especially if you apply some like right on your wrists, because for me, holding the animal I'm going to be result, like their head holding their like the rest of their body this way but having control of their head that way that immediately kind of helps like get into their system that way and then eventually over time their anxiety eases so yeah um I kind of still wish that this was because oh, I'm used to doing webinars by Google Hangouts and also I do the journey group by that. Yeah, so that is, I, I said I wouldn't go into internal application, and I did kind of cover some of the different applications of how you would do it aromatically versus topically. So if you guys do have any other further questions, then they email or send a um, text message or a phone call or give a phone call, and I will be happy to address any further issues or any further challenges or questions, or if you would like me to go into more detail in certain aspects, then, um, then definitely let me know, and I would be more than happy to at least put out one to two webinars a month. So the month of February was kind of like a, um, a an experimental month, so thank you you guys for me and some of the um in, in some of the previous webinars but i do hope that this is something that continues so if anyone has any suggestions feel free to uh, um to let me know and then um a lot of the events because uh, i've kind of battled with this myself but a lot of the events as well as the education that i give i do it for free but I always accept donations because I do a lot of my payments for Eagle Therapies as sliding scale. So I always give like a recommended what I would recommend being paid. But I do understand people's um, people's ability in order to give just because of financial restrictions or anything thereof. So I am happy to work with you if you want to to me and recommendations on like um, a scenario that you have with your pet and I'd be happy to kind of recommend different things. So I do work um, at Deepwood Veterinary Clinic. So uh, if you guys want to reach me there, you can also do that. My days are Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So uh, just feel free to reach out. So there are multiple ways to do that. But I hope that, that you guys have learned something from this and uh, positive feedback. Yay. All right, cool. <laughs> well, I hope that you guys have an awesome day and, or awesome evening because it's about 8 o'clock now. So, yeah, take care, you guys. Have fun.